All right. Um, so hello everyone once again, uh, and welcome to the Fusion AP Talks, a student-led webinar platform for sharing knowledge about nuclear fusion, science, and engineering. I'm Dhawal, and I would like to introduce our speaker today, Bob Davis. Uh, Bob has recently completed his PhD uh, on the topic of kinetic ballooning mode studies and the trans uh, and the treatment of electromagnetic microinstabilities and turbulence in complex geometry at the University of York in England. He is now employed as a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics in Greifswald in Germany, and his current research is the modeling and optimization of diverters in stellarity. Bob will uh, Bob will talk about uh, the work he did during his PhD. So, without uh, further delay, I would like to give the floor to Bob. Uh, please uh, take it from here. Oh, uh, jolly good! Uh, thank you very much, Noel. Uh, so, the first thing I'll do. You share my screen. Great. Uh, so, um, uh, as Deval said, uh, my name is Bob Davies, and I'm going to be giving a talk today about gyrokinetics and about spherical tokamaks. And this is work which I did as part of my PhD at the University of York. So, here's what I'll be talking about. I'll start with a little bit of motivation. Then I'll give some background on gyrokinetics and gyrokinetic codes. And then I'll describe uh, how gyrokinetic codes uh, can be used in, in, in the design of uh, fusion power plants by talking about uh, a piece of work which I did during my PhD to do with spherical, spherical tokamaks. And then I'll finally wrap up. So uh, the big picture, of course, is that we want to build nuclear fusion power stations. This is the this is the big goal. But of course, this is this is very challenging to do. And a big challenge which one has to address is that of plasma turbulence. Uh, plasma turbulence is important uh, because it's often the dominant transport mechanism in magnetically confined fusion reactors. And this affects the uh, plasma density, the temperature and the energy confinement. And it's usually the uh, it, it usually constrains the density and the temperature because um, the turbulence is driven by, by small scale instabilities, which, which are sometimes called micro instabilities. Uh, and these will tend to grow if you try to push the density and temperature gradients beyond a critical value. So in this way, turbulence effectively regulates the density and temperature profiles which can be achieved. So ultimately, the commercial viability of fusion reactors depends upon us being able to understand plasma microinstabilities and turbulence. And so this, this behooves us to, to study it. Uh, and how do we do this? Well, fortunately, there's an equation which describes uh, microinstabilities and turbulence, which is usually valid, which is called the gyrokinetic equation, which is shown here. Uh, the, the details of this equation are not important for this talk, so don't panic. Um, the point is that uh, there's an H here. This H is a distribution function, so it tells us about turbulent fluctuations inside the plasma. And H evolves in time in response to various physical phenomena, which are all, which are all shown here. Uh, one other point which is worth noting in this equation is that there's this chi which turns up in a couple of places. This chi is related to the fluctuating electromagnetic fields which are generated by the plasma. And, and, and these are given by the quasi-neutrality equation and by Ampere's law. And so these field equations together with the gyrokinetic equation this forms the, the gyrokinetic Maxwell system of equations to describe turbulence. Uh, now, this, uh, this gyrokinetic system is essentially a simplified kinetic model, simplified to make the problem tractable. Nevertheless, uh, it still has a few challenging features. So uh, the, the, the gyrokinetic system is five-dimensional, um, it contains um, integrals as well as derivatives of the distribution function to make it integral differential. Uh, it's a nonlinear uh, system, and it's also multi-scale, 
because it, it contains kinetics to do with ions and electrons, and these have very different masses. And uh, for these reasons, in realistic fusion plasmas, one usually needs to, to solve the gyrokinetic system numerically rather than analytically. And so for this, we use uh, gyrokinetic software or gyrokinetic codes, uh, which are usually, and uh, as I'll be talking about in this talk, these are time marching schemes, uh, which means that one essentially uh, picks some value of the distribution function h and then um, evolves it forwards in time uh, using this equation. So how exactly does that work? Uh, here's a little bit of background on, on the gyrokinetic codes. Um, so uh, one specifies uh, some properties of the plasma equilibrium. Uh, this is important because it typically uh, determines the um, uh, the magnetic drifts as well as uh, the the density and temperature gradients, which which drive the instabilities. Uh, one discretizes the gyrokinetic equation in time, uh, picks some initial value for the distribution function, and then one. Uh, evolves the the gyrokinetic system forwards in time uh, using using some time step uh, in order to find the distribution function at some later point in time. And to do this time marching, uh, there are a number of algorithms which are available to the user. Um, some of them are, are listed here, um, but I won't describe them in detail. Now, once uh, one has uh, evaluated the distribution function at some later point in time, one can then uh, infer um, the quantities which, which we might want to know about. So for example, transport, transport coefficients. Uh, so these gyrokinetic codes, uh, they vary a lot in, in complexity and in the exact flavor of gyrokinetic model which they use. Um, and also in computational time, but they can be used for a number of things. Uh, one of which is to is to understand experimental results. One is to predict or or, or inform um, what sort of experiments what sort of experiments uh, should be considered. And then uh, finally, and the subject of this talk is to examine sort of hypothetical um, fusion plasmas in order to see to see how they behave and and their viability as uh, as fusion reactors and so to give a specific example of this i'll talk about um some work which i did in my phd uh which is on spherical tokamaks so here's a little bit of background about the spherical tokamak uh so it's uh characterized by a small aspect ratio so that's the um the uh, major radius divided by the minor radius um and it typically operates at, at a higher plasma beta than the conventional tokamak and is usually uh, more strongly shaped so for example by elongating the plasma vertically so here's a sort of cartoonish picture of, of a conventional uh, aspect ratio tokamak with an aspect ratio of three uh, and then a spherical tokamak at the bottom. Uh, this, uh, the fact that the spherical tokamak plasma is usually strongly shaped, this um, usually has important consequences for stability and in particular um, makes, makes accessing higher plasma betas um, generally, generally easier. Now here we've got elongation in the plasma. Another um, important shaping parameter is the triangularity. And so that's cartoonistically shown in these plots. So in the top row, we've got the conventional aspect ratio tokamak. And then in the bottom row, we've got the spherical tokamak. Um, and uh, on the in the yellow, we've got with no triangularity. In the middle, we've got uh, positive triangularity. So this is where the, the plasma cross-section is sort of D-shaped and it's pointy on the outboard side. And then on in, in the blue on the far right, we've got the opposite case where we have negative triangularity. 
this is where the pointy bit is on the inside. Uh, so this is particularly interesting to, to, to think about the negative triangularity because there have been experiments performed uh, in, in D3D and in TCB, which are both conventional aspect ratio, uh, in which it appears that uh, there's a reduction in turbulence as a result of changing from positive triangularity to negative triangularity. And so this is, of course, uh, very interesting and, 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 and it begs the question, uh, is this also a good idea in spherical tokamaks? Um, now, one does have to be a little bit careful in spherical tokamaks because, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the spherical tokamak uh, typically operates at a higher plasma beta, and this means that it's more susceptible to electromagnetic instabilities. There's one instability in particular, uh, which, uh, which I'll talk about, which is called the kinetic ballooning mode, or KBM. Uh, I won't describe in detail the um uh the physics of the instability but the point is that it's uh, an electromagnetic uh micro instability which is driven by uh pressure gradients in the plasma and it's particularly problematic uh, as as the plasma beta increases and therefore this is an instability which is of particular relevance to spherical hockamax um now, the kinetic ballooning mode has, has a sort of ideal magneto-hydrodynamic analog or equivalent, um, which is called the N equals infinity ideal MHD ballooning mode or ideal, ideal MHD ballooning mode. Um, this, the, the stability of, of the ideal ballooning mode is quite easy to compute because the ideal MHD model is, is much simpler than the gyrokinetic model. And for this reason, the ideal ballooning mode is, is often used as a proxy for the, for the kinetic ballooning mode. And uh, it typically has this sort of stability profile. Um, so here's, here's a, a, a plot of stability for the ideal MHD mode as a function of the normalized pressure gradient on the x-axis, and then the magnetic shear of the plasma in the y-axis. So uh, what one really wants is to operate in regions of high pressure gradient, because high pressure gradient means uh, large plasma density and or large plasma temperature, and therefore lots of fusion reactions. And so this is the, is the desirable region. Unfortunately, uh, this, this region where the mode is unstable this tends to sort of the nose comes downwards when one makes triangularity negative and so this is a sort of clue that that we might have to start worrying about um the kinetic ballooning mode in negative triangularity spherical tokamaks uh so that's a little bit of the background and so uh in in, in this piece of work what we did was we assessed the viability of negative triangularity in spherical tokamak uh, fusion power plants by performing gyrokinetic simulations of several model equilibria. Uh, so here are some details about the equilibria which uh, we chose to look at. Uh, so we have three equilibria uh, and, their, and their block surfaces are shown here. We have one which is uh, negative triangularity. So we've got the, the pointy bit of the plasma is on the inboard side. And then the other two uh, equilibria which we have is the positive triangularity. So it's sort of pointy on the outside. And the difference between these two equilibria is their, um, what I call here, Q naught. So this is the safety factor on the magnetic axis. In the high Q0 case, um, we prescribed a, a um, hollow current profile, and this boosts the on-axis safety factor. Um, and, and as we shall see, this has some consequences for, for micro instabilities. Um, so here, here, here are the flux surfaces, and then here uh, is the um, 
the shaping parameters. So we've got the elongation kappa and the triangularity delta as a function of the uh, radial coordinate. So this is a normalized um, psi, so um, normalized to be one of the last closed flux surface. And so we can see that in the in the negative triangularity case, we have negative triangularity across the plasma. And then in the other two cases, we have positive triangularity across the plasma. Uh, so the next ingredient that we need for our study is, is a gyrokinetic code so we can perform our simulations. Uh, and so for this study, uh, we use the gyrokinetic code GS2. Uh, and there are some details about it in this, in this uh, citation. Uh, GS2 is a code uh, which is um, which is developed with some particular simplifications in mind in order to make the simulations as fast as possible. So these are, are listed here. I won't talk about them in detail, but uh, thanks to thanks to these simplifications, uh, GS2 simulations take a short amount of time to run, so of the order CPU minutes uh, for the problems which I've run. And this is uh, very fast compared to some of the other gyrokinetic codes which are out there. The speed is good because it means that one can uh, uh, perform many simulations uh, across different, um, different parameters. The other thing to note about the simulations which I performed is that these are linear gyrokinetic simulations. What this means is that we uh, have ignored or dropped the nonlinear term from the gyrokinetic equation. And this means that the, uh, the system of equations is linear. Being linear, this means that the, um, the uh, eigen modes of the, of the problem uh, grow or decay exponentially. Uh, so h as a function of time is just um, the, the eigen mode uh, at, at, at zero, and then um, with with a frequency and uh, uh, a growth rate or a decay rate, depending on the sign of gamma. And so, uh, what we did in this study was we performed linear gyrokinetic simulations using GS two of the various uh, of the three different equilibria, uh, and we uh, performed the simulations at each radial location in the plasma. So first of all, let's take a look at the results for the uh, negative triangularity. So that's shown here. So on the y-axis, we have the, uh, the growth rate of the, of the most strongly growing instability. And then on the x-axis, we have the radial coordinate in the plasma. Uh, and, and, and then this is plotted for several different values of binormal wave number. Um, we have these different wave numbers. This is a result of us performing a, a Fourier transform in the directions perpendicular to the magnetic field. What one notices is that uh, we have growth rates which are large across the core of the plasma. And this coincides with where the plasma is unstable to the ideal MHD ballooning mode. Uh, so this sort of uh, confirms our suspicions that, that when we make the triangularity negative, we destabilize the ideal MHD uh, ballooning mode. And then for this reason, the kinetic ballooning mode is, uh, is also unstable and we have relatively large growth rates. Um, and, and this is bad news. This essentially means that we're likely to have a large amount of turbulent transport uh, such that um, these, these equilib this equilibrium would not be sustainable for a realistic amount of, of, of heating and fueling. Uh, when I say relatively large, um, what does one compare it to? So um, I, I've also plotted in this dotted line uh, the so-called uh, ham bowel shearing rate. And so um, this is this is important because uh, an equilibrium an equilibrium amount of uh, E cross B shear can can provide a stabilizing influence on the plasma, uh, and this is crudely estimated from the equilibrium. And the point is that the 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 growth rates across a number of wave numbers is 
is significantly larger than the estimated shearing rate. So it's unlikely that that equal species would be able to stabilize um, these modes. So um, this this suggests that negative triangularity is not a good idea where spherical proxmax are concerned. Um, but there's a little bit more which we can do. So one might be tempted to, to ask, well, how do we know that these instabilities are actually the KBM and they're not something else? Uh, and so um, what I did was I produced uh, a stability map um, like the one we saw before for the ideal ballooning mode. Uh, but this time, it's um, each point represents a gyrokinetic simulation. So again, on the y-axis, we have the magnetic shear. And on the x-axis, we have the plasma pressure gradient. What one notices is that uh, we have large instability growth rates um, within this red boundary. The red boundary is the boundary for the ideal NHD ballooning mode. In other words, wherever we're unstable to the ideal ballooning mode, uh, we have a large growth rate. And so that suggests that the instability we're looking at is in fact the kinetic ballooning mode. The other bad piece of news, which one sees from this diagram, is that um, we no longer have access to this, to this region of high pressure gradient because the ideal ballooning instability boundary is all the way down to zero magnetic shear. In other words, one would need to go to a negative magnetic shear across a significant range of the plasma in order to be able to access high pressure gradients. So this is bad news. Uh, it suggests that if you wanted to build a spherical tokamak with negative triangularity, you'd, you'd be forced to operate uh, at these low values of, of pressure gradient, uh, and it would therefore be challenging to make the, uh, the reactor economically viable. Uh, so this was the case for the negative triangularity equilibrium. And so now I'll quickly show some results for the positive triangularity. Uh, so here I've got the same plots uh, with the growth rate against the radial position. In the top, we've got um, the high Q0 case. And in the bottom, we've got the low Q0 case. And then this purple line is a line from the negative triangularity equilibrium, which is just shown for comparison. What one notices straight away is that the, um, the growth rates in the positive triangularity equilibria are much lower than that in the negative triangularity case. Um, and across much of the plasma, they're comparable to the estimated uh, harm barrel shearing rate. So this is good news. Of course, one would need to run full nonlinear gyrokinetic simulations in order to estimate the transport quantities. Uh, so in other words, to, to actually work out what the, what the heat fluxes are and what the particle fluxes are. But nevertheless, um, it, it looks likely that one would be able to, to construct um, spherical tokamak equilibria um, with with a reasonable amount of, of, of fusion power, but without having uh, large growth rates. Uh, the other thing to note is that in the low Q0 case, uh, there is a region where we're unstable to the ideal ballooning mode, uh, and this happens to coincide with um, uh, some, a sort of peak in the, in the long wavelength instability growth rate. And so what this tells us is that the uh, the on-axis safety factor can also be tuned in such a way as to um, optimize the turbulence properties in our reactors. And then uh, a final result slide, which I'll show, is the just for the high Q0 case, a stability map. Um, so uh, the equilibrium point here uh, is, is this white cross. And one sees that we're now uh, below the, the kind of nose of the ideal unstable region. And um, this is coinciding with, with small gyrokinetic growth rates, which is good. Uh, now, the problem is a little bit more complicated than, uh, than I've described thus far, because if one sort of zooms in to this region, one gets the plot on the right. In the plot on the right, what one sees is that the uh, the gyrokinetic growth rate actually smoothly crosses the ideal 
stability boundary. And so in fact, um, even, even though we're ideal ballooning stable, the dominant instability, which we see here, still appears to be a kinetic ballooning mode. And so this is interesting because this is telling us that there's some sort of kinetic effect, which is included in the geokinetic model, but not in the MHD model, uh, which, is, which is causing the mode to be destabilized. And so what this is saying is that um, even in positive triangularity, spherical tokamak equilibria, one still uh, should, should bear in mind uh, that the kinetic ballooning mode can have some, some important consequences. Uh, so this brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, to summarize the key points, um, the viability of magnetically confined fusion power plants uh, depends upon micro instabilities and turbulence, and we can study these using gyrokinetic codes. And in the results which I presented, I showed a study of um, of um, the kinetic ballooning mode for spherical tokamak equilibria with different values of triangularity. And the results of this, of this study suggest that negative triangularity is unlikely to be commercially viable in spherical tokamak power plants. There are more details on this uh, in, in, in this paper, which um, was, was published last year. But of course, um, I'm happy to, to take any questions now. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Bob, for the insightful talk. Um, I would now like to open the question and answer session. Okay, so we have a question from Dieter. I hope I did not, um, yeah, butcher your name. <laughs> Please go ahead and ask the question. Okay, hello, Bob. Thanks a lot for uh, for your talk. I basically had a kind of basic question about these geokinetic codes because you showed now mainly how you're using them for uh, to study basically the um, yeah, the, the core region of your tokamak, and I was wondering, um, how can you use them also to study the micro instabilities in the edge? Is this possible with these kind of tools, or do you need different tools for it? Mm, uh, yes, um, uh, this is this is a, a good and interesting question, uh, and, and 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 the short answer is yes, one can use gyrokinetics to, to 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 look at instabilities at the edge. Um, there are, however, sort of a couple of uh, a couple of things which one needs to be careful of. So one of these is that um, in the in the core of the plasma, uh, the the magnitude of the turbulence is much smaller than the magnitude of the equilibrium quantities typically. Uh, but this isn't really true at the edge of the plasma because, of course, at the edge of the plasma, the density is quite low, and so the turbulent fluctuations in the density can be quite large. Uh, and so there are gyrokinetic codes which which do model the, the edge, um, but because they can make fewer simplifying assumptions, uh, they can be more expensive. Okay, I see. So then you basically, when you really would use it for the edge, then you change these assumptions which we showed before, then you change them a little bit, and then it's more adapted for the edge. Precisely, yes, yes. And so, uh, okay. yes, yes. Thanks a lot. Julio, to would yes, you like thank to you very questions? much. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, this is actually a question of a very general kind. I have a certain doubt about the spherical tokamak in the sense that uh, since you have a very high uh, magnetic field uh, gradient, the average pressure tends to be much slower than in the case of uh, the conventional tokamak. Uh, isn't this a problem for for a fusion plant? Um, so, so you're saying that, uh, the, the gradient of the magnetic field tends to be much sharper. And so right. this means that the, the magnetic field is, uh, is. Right. Is so if you wish to, if, if you wish to increase the average magnetic pressure, you would, you would still need to increase the uh, toroidal magnetic field. And, uh, this defeats the whole idea of uh, having a higher beta. Um, so, so I think what I would say to this is that, um, the, um, is that the spherical tokamaks are able to, to, 
to operate at this at this high plasma beta. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and so this means that for a given magnetic pressure, the, the plasma pressure is 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 greater. Uh, I, I, I agree that it would be challenging to 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 make a viable low beta spherical talk Mac. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yes, I I um, I'm not really sure I I understand your point about uh, about about how you would have a low plasma pressure mm -hmm. for a given for a given beta and magnetic field. Yes, and actually we know that in the present experiments, the pressure in spherical tokamaks tends to be much lower than in conventional tokamaks. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, um, yes, I'm. Uh, I, I I'm not sure I can I can speak to current spherical tokamak uh, experimental results. Uh, mm -hmm. I think what I what I would say is that um, there are uh, there are model equilibria which seem quite well behaved, which have been produced by the UK as part of their mm -hmm. step program. So this is spherical tokamak for for energy right. production, uh, and and so sort of it's it's certainly the case that these model equilibria exist. In which one can, um, in which one can, for example, estimate the fusion power, which is of course mm -hmm. what we all care about, uh, and, and, and and this is viable. I mean, e even in these equilibria which I've shown, uh, the uh, for the for the positive triangularity, one has eight hundred megawatts of uh, fusion power, and so yes, I I think that I would consider this sufficiently high pressure. Thank you very much. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I think Dieter wanted to ask another question. If you want to have a go, please uh, do not hesitate, Dieter. Yeah, I think that my question is already for a big part answered because I was basically also wondering if, um, yeah, the outcome of your research from, from these instabilities, what was the, the consequence of that for commercial spherical tokamaks? But I think you partially answered that already in the in the previous question, but that was what I was still wondering. Um, yes, yes. Um, uh, of course, uh, yes. The uh, spherical tokamaks, which are commercially viable, are, are are the subject of active active investigation at the moment. Um, and and so I think really what my results speak to is 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 to say that uh, uh, there's one thing which which you probably shouldn't do, which is to which is to build them with negative triangularity. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. All right, then, if uh, there are no further questions, uh, I would like to formally thank our speaker for the wonderful talk today um, and also for all the attendees for their participation uh, by asking questions. Uh, okay. Uh, and, and yeah, um, thank you so much. Have a great day ahead, wherever you are. Thank you so very much, everyone, for joining.